Alright, I'm going over more about adverse selection and moral hazard because it's helpful to see this explained in multiple different ways. Different ways connect with different people, so um, I'm giving this another try. Um, so, how do you know the difference between adverse selection and moral hazard? How do you know if one or the other of those is at play? Um, and really, so the, the biggest questions you want to ask up front are, with adverse selection, are there certain types of people who are more or potentially less attracted to participate? And what does it mean to participate? That depends on the scenario. And with moral hazard, it's really about, are there certain behaviors that are incentivized? So, of course, ad moral hazard is about, is, are we talking about behaviors? And adverse selection is, are we talking about the inherent type of person? And they would be that type whether or not um, there was a situation with adverse selection and moral hazard. It's really about types. And then after you've figured out that maybe one or the other of those is at play, you ask yourself, does this create, does the fact that there are these behaviors incentivized, are these people attracted to this situation, does that create a negative experience? Um, or sometimes it's a negative product um, for the group of participants. And once again, participants is kind of a vague situation, but um, is there a negative experience or product because of the behaviors that were incentivized or because of the type of person attracted to the situation? And then if the answer to those is yes, the, ask yourself, is there a contract at place? Is there any kind of thing that sort of here's the contract that's creating these behavioral incentives? Or here's the contract that these certain types of people are attracted to, which creates something negative for a larger group of people. So that's another way of explaining adverse selection and moral hazard. Let me go over a few examples um, so one of them is a fraternity. So fraternities have contracts, rules under which they operate. What are the rights and responsibilities of members? And of course one of those rules might be that um, they buy as much alcohol as people, as anyone who comes to their parties will drink. And they split the bill evenly among the fraternity members. That might be one type of contract. And there might be another fraternity across the street that has a budget for their alcohol and it's a limited budget, but the payment to the fraternity for alcohol is this fixed dollar amount per, um, per year or per semester. So those two ty types of contracts are going to incentivize both behaviors and types of people attracted to the fraternity. So the pay for all alcohol that anyone coming to our parties can drink, that contract for the, the fraternity obviously is going to create certain Friday night behaviors of um, relating to how much the fraternity members there drink and how much their guests drink. And it may also influence the type of person who is attracted to that type of fraternity. And does it create a negative bias? Does that particular contract create a negative bias? It could. Um, you could imagine a situation where it um, incentivizes people to drink and drink and drink and there's just a lot of drunkenness. It could also incentivize um, people who drink a lot to be attracted to the fraternity, which could, for some people, have a negative effect on it. So the contract itself is the fraternity rules and ways of being, the rights and responsibilities of participation in the fraternity, and both adverse selection and moral hazard are at play. Now, these two things oftentimes go together. They're taught together, usually when they show up in economics textbooks, and there is a reason for that. It's because oftentimes, yeah, they appear together. Now, I gave this example in another one of my videos of um, friends who spit, split the bill when they go out to dinner. And I said this was an example of moral hazard because, of course, when you decide at the beginning of dinner that you're going to split the bill equally, peep that incentivizes certain behaviors that people will order fancier drinks, order more expensive meals, order more desserts than they would um, if they were paying exactly for what they bought. So it does create behavior incentives. And in that video, I think I said, um, that's more moral hazard. There's not adverse selection at play. But then a student um, came up with the 
brilliant insight that, wait a second, actually, if your friends do this very often, if this isn't an unexpected thing, if every time your friends go out, they agree at the beginning of dinner that all 10 people will split the belt equally, that could definitely create a bias in who agrees to go out with you. Um, I mean, you saw this, there's an episode of Friends where the people who are lower income are very uncomfortable with that sometimes. You might imagine some of those friends who know that this is going to happen, who don't have a lot of money, might choose not to go out with those people as often. So there's also an adverse selection factor at play. So um, I was wrong to say that that's just a moral hazard situation. That's definitely also an adverse selection situation. Um, there's an, another example here that I, I read somewhere, I can't remember where I read this, but someone came up with the idea that there would be a pool of students who came together to pay off their student loans. And how it would work is, if you bought into this pool, there would be a 15% garner on your wages. So any money you made, 15% um, would be taken out, it would be put into the pool, and the pool would pay off everybody's student loans at an equal pace, so that everybody's loans finished off and you didn't have to pay off your own individual loans because this pool of people was coming together to do that. Now you might imagine if they set up a situation like that, will adverse selection and moral hazard be at play? Well, I mean, obviously adverse selection, the types of people who would be attracted to that sort of thing are going to be the types of people with a lot of student loans, those with heavy debts, and those who don't expect to make very much after they graduate. Maybe they're going to go be a missionary, they're going to go be a starving artist, they're going to go into a low-wage um, position, or they have a high amount of loans. Those kinds of people are going to be attracted to that. If you have um, a low student loans, and or if you're getting a higher paying job, you're not going to be attracted to that. So because of that, it creates a bias in terms of um, the actual product. The students who buy into that, there's going to be a large lump of loans to pay off, and there, there may not be as much money coming in to pay those loans off very quickly. That's a negative bias in terms of the actual product. And the contract, of course, are the rules for going in with the student loan payoff pool. So certainly adverse selection is at play. Could moral hazard be at play there? Um, yeah, maybe. It could be that if you're trying to decide between the starving artist job and the high paying salary job, if you went into this loan, that would affect your behavior so that you'd choose the position that didn't make as much money. So it could, this contract could influence both behavior and certainly would influence the types of people attracted to that contract. So that's just a little bit more information and a few more examples on adverse selection and moral hazard.